Hello, everyone. This is Goda Bapuji. Thank you, Red Team Village and the Dyna Initiative for inviting me here. Today, I'm going to talk about critical infrastructure, interconnected risks, and why we should care. As a woman in tech, this is particularly an important matter for me, and I'm going to share why this is so. Um, so this is what we're going to do. I'll tell you a little bit about what critical infrastructure is, what we mean by Industry 4.0, and we'll also try and understand some general terms that we use in cybersecurity and understand the interrelated risks. And then we go on to look at some of the more um, threats and vulnerabilities. But on top of that, we're also going to understand what cognitive and sociocultural limitations are and how and why we need to understand this in order to build resilience um, through preparedness and capacity planning. We'll look at some of the gaps and some of the barriers, especially from a gender perspective. And this is why um, women should specifically be looking at this presentation. Thank you, and let's begin. So what is criti critical infrastructure? Critical infrastructure are those essential public services, such as hospitals, banking, schools, water treatment plants, etc. And traditionally, what has happened is these systems have existed for many years, but in the modern context, these systems are now connected increasingly via the internet, and we are automating them so that we can remotely administer them. This is, in short, what we call the Industry 4.0. And um, here's a really good definition that I really like from the Center for Protection of National Infrastructure, United Kingdom. Uh, national infrastructure are those facilities, systems, sites, information, people, networks, and processes necessary for a country to function and upon which daily life depends. So pay attention to the keyword daily life dependency. It also includes some functions, sites and organizations which are not critical to the maintenance of essential services, but which need protection due to the potential danger to public. Example, chemical sites. So here's a really good graphic. And if you guys see um, all of the links that I've used for different graphics and different references for this presentation, I have listed them at the bottom of the slide. So you will be able to um, go to this website and look at it in much more detail. Um, so if you look at um, the history of our industries on sort of a timeline, there was an original um, inventions of steam engines, uh, mechanization and water power. And then when electricity was invented, we went on to, we discovered electric based industries and we went on to mass production. In the, um, after the war, we discovered a lot of technology that revolved around internet. The internet was created, which actually created a whole different world in which we could work in. And then when electronics took hold, we had the whole automation take on a completely different meaning. Now we come to what we call as the fourth industrial revolution. What does that mean? It's basically just an extension of everything we have until today, including the internet, but there's more automation and there's more remote administration. And we also sometimes call it the cyber physical systems because now the traditional physical systems that have existed across the three uh, past industrial revolutions are now more being brought onto the internet. So this graphic is a really good one. Um, what is an industrial control system? So I tr I, I'm giving you a very simplistic definition here. Industrial control systems are a set of components, devices and systems that together control, administer and manage the critical infrastructure. And um, you will hear of this terminology the ICS folks may talk about this. So you hear of things like process control system, distributed control system, PLCs, programming, uh, programmable logic controllers, SCADA systems. Um, just remember that these are all different systems that are now additionally accessible remotely via the internet on the cyber realm. I've um, been asked this question a few times. Um, so ICS security, is it not the same as IT security? And of course, I've also heard uh, a bit of confusion between IT security and information security. But here's the thing, I ICS security varies from IT security because the attack vectors and the impact surface bleed into civilian lives. 
if you remember the first slide, our lives depend on the services that we receive from hospitals, banking, schools, and different infrastructure. So we depend on these services on a day-to-day -day basis, which means if something happens to any of these services, our lives directly get impacted. So as you can see, this is completely different from how a, a cyber attack may impact an IT infrastructure. And ICS basically works in two main types of scenarios. Now this is, um, it goes to a bit of engineering uh, terminology and those of you folks who come from an engineering background might easily understand this. That the two uh, main scenarios are process-based industries and discrete-based industries. Now what's happening is electrical and mechanical have converged on the cyber realm, which means previously, um, whatever was protected through obscurity is now exposed because of the internet and because um, the internet allows remote administration, we are able to con control different aspects at the physical state remotely. So just imagine a pivoted attack in a process-based industry. The entire um, downward cycle gets impacted, um, whereas in a typical industry, process-based industry or discrete-based industry, safety is a top priority. Then comes reliability of the process. And then the information security CIA triad, which is the confidentiality, integrity, availability triad comes next. But we have to remember the golden rule, must not harm people. And that is key here for ICS security. They care more about safety. So here's a little graphic that I thought was really good and um, summarized the difference between process versus discrete based industry. So you can see here process manufacturing industries, food beverages, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, chemicals. Um, these are all examples of process based manufacturing, whereas discrete manufacturing, as you can see here, they are parts based manufacturing. So examples are in um, medical devices, electrical, uh, electrical equipment, automobile manufacturing uh, and things like that. So if you now look at the whole picture at a very high level, you understand that what we call cybersecurity, cyber in the sense network security, everything that we do on the internet impacts every aspect of our life. So I put together a little graphic to show us this interconnection. Cybersecurity provides overall human security. It ensures service availability. It assures integrity and it impacts all of these services. Now, these are not exhaustively listed on this graphic, but you get the idea based on the previous discussion that we had. So why should we as civilians care? Well, I already told you that Internet of Things blurs the line between electrical and mechanical. And what we thought was previously secure because it was just a physical safety aspect and not on the internet you could simply lock the door put a padlock on it and think it's secure but now that is exposed on the internet so the security through obscurity no longer seems valid which also means that engineering operational architecture and design professionals can no more say oh security does not impact us cyber attacks don't impact us we cannot say that anymore which means also that when operational folks, when engineers design infrastructures for cities and industrial systems, we not only have to think about safety, but we have to think about security and privacy as well. Because our lives depend on these daily services. So what? What are the risks of connecting these devices to the Internet? And there's that term that we used Internet of Things. So he, you might be very familiar looking at these um, acronyms IoT and IIoT, Internet of Things and Industrial Internet of Things. Now here's a little question for you to think about. Do we really need our personal coffee maker, our toaster, our refrigerator, or our smart TV on the internet? Think about it. Is it necessary? I don't think it is. So we need to understand the risks before we do something, before we put our enable the smartness on our TV. We need to think, is it really necessary? Do you really need to check your egg levels from your iPhone in the um, refrigerator? So let's look at the 
risks, threats, vulnerabilities, um, and some of those things. Now, here's a really gr uh, good picture that I like sharing. And um, this is from the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report. Um, you can see the link at the bottom. This is from the 2020 report. Um, this is a, a great visual to help you see what I mean by interconnected risks. Typically, when you think of risks, you, you know, we might think, OK, if I do this, something happens. But then in an interconnected risk, you have to think, if I do this, what are the different things that might happen? Or if something happens somewhere, how is it going to impact me? And that is the meaning of interconnected risks. So as you can see, this is not linear. It is almost like a node in a graph. So there are multi-point variables from where you could be impacted because something is happening which is causing something else somewhere. And you could be impacted because of that. That's how we need to think in our margin context. And that's why I really like this picture. Um, there's another important thing. Um, defense and military organizations like NATO have formally recognized cyberspace as a new frontier in defense, along with land, air, sea, which means the cyber realm could be used to wage cyber warfare on the computer networks. What does it mean? It means that the Alliance could use cyber weapons to manage global threats to systems and infrastructure used by NATO allies. Remember this keyword, allies, North America and European countries. What about other countries? Are they prepared? In short, is the civilian world ready for the impact from new generation warfare? That's the key question we need to ask ourselves. Let's look at this now. It's an interesting map and it's from imperva.com. And just not to um, uh, sort of take it out of context, but actually to bring it into context, if you look at this map today, you might think maybe these are COVID infections, COVID-19 infections, but actually not. This is from 2016 when the Mirai botnet infected computers all over the world. And surprisingly, it was a very simple attack, a distributed denial of service attack, and it targeted CCTV's cameras, DVRs, routers. So you see what I mean of how pervasive internet attacks can get and control our lives. Um, the International Federation of Red Cross actually helps us uh, divide disasters into um, five uh, big um, types. So you've got the geophysical disasters, you've got biological, you've got climate disaster, and you've got weather-related disasters, and you've got hydrological disasters. But think about this. On top of the existing disasters that we already know that are quite complex as it is, earthquakes, fires, tsunamis, on top of these things, think about the social inequities that exist in our societies. And then think about the irreversible damage we are doing to our ecosystems, to our biodiversity. And think about the unsustained, unhindered development policies that put profits over people. These are all the counteracting forces. On top of that, think about inequitable technological developments. Which means if you don't really pay attention to the stuff that we're putting online, to the type of code we are writing, to the security and safety of our systems. When something happens, now think about the interrelated risks picture that I showed you. The innermost circle that you see, a geophysical disaster, like an earthquake, might impact internet systems, which means people who are already in poverty may not be able to access services that are provided online. COVID-19 has actually shown us how life can be during a global pandemic, something that affects everybody across the world. The entire world was shut down, but we all got along. We all kept together. One reason, we had the internet with us. But just imagine if the internet were to be impacted. The internet cannot become our single point of failure, and this is why it's important for us to pay attention to this fact. So what are the types of vulnerabilities that the internet faces and why is this important? More than you can believe, the internet actually allows us to conduct several types of attacks. Sometimes 
human become the weakest links. Because what happens usually is we pay a lot of attention to, um, you know, installing um, uh, SSL certificates, to doing our, giving our great UX, UI on our systems. But some of the core services that start at the physical level or some of the core services that are at the database level, we typically tend to ignore them or forget them or think that, oh, this is on the innermost network. Nobody's able to access it. That's a typical excuse that we hear. But then just imagine, with more and more interconnected systems, it is harder for us to find out where the attack is coming from, which means we are not sure of the vectors of the attack. It could be from anywhere. And this graphic is really neat because this gives us sort of a, um, a high level overview of the different types of attacks that could happen in an industrial system. On top of that, as you may already know, mobile phones have their own problems. They are not completely secure. Well, you might say, yeah, I'm going to turn off my locations setting in, in the settings, but turning off location settings does not completely resolve the issue. The device itself has location tracking abilities, and there are several issues within the device software itself. So mobile phones have their own set of problems that complicate issues further. So just think if you're using the mobile phone to remotely administer your systems, your critical systems, that's not a very good idea. Over that, you've got networking protocols that have their own limitations. A lot of these protocols have been our legacy protocols. They have been written many years ago. Are they forward compatible? We try to patch them every now and then, right? We try to do our maintenance on our systems, yes, but inherently, a lot of these protocols have limitations within themselves. And you may have heard a lot about the issues around the 5G network, but do your research. Don't believe what the media tells you. Don't believe what you see on the internet. I suggest you do your own research, read scientific journals, read engineering journals, make sure they come from reputable sources. Look at the number of citations for each of these articles. And then you understand the type of issues that your networking protocols have. Software maintenance brings additional complexity in highly interconnected systems, especially now if you couple them with your critical systems. And that's why it's important for us to critically think if and how we should connect our industrial systems to the network and not just our industrial systems, but also our daily life stuff that we say as an in Internet of Things within our homes onto the network. Because here's a thought. Although we might say, oh, I don't have any important data on me. There's nothing um, expensive that I hold or there's nothing confidential that I hold. But what usually happens is if you don't pay attention to the security of your devices at your home or in your small business, your system could be used as one of the routes through which other attacks could be launched. So you have to really pay attention to even your security. And here's the fact. As humans, we have cognitive limitations which means you also have to remember that artificial intelligence code can also have these bias and limitation built in as a result. Because the way we think, the way we make decisions, those decisions will be reflected in the way we program and write these AI code and the way we train ML to recognize um, the, uh, the learning patterns. So it's very important to recognize that we have cognitive lim limitations that will impact security and safety. And here's a nice uh, matrix on a grid. Uh, this comes from a, the very famous book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman and Swirsky. And it's called a fourfold pattern of preferences. What it basically tells you is that as humans, we have fallacies, which means depending on whether we are winning or losing, how much risk we are willing to take changes 
And this metrics is a very good way to look at it. And we also work under many limitations. For example, you've got laws that give you the overarching rules of how you have to work within your environment. You've got regulations and then you've got contractual ob obligations. But on top of that, you've got geopolitics and you've got your social cultural norms that tell you whether or not you should be doing something, how much integrity do you have, whether the you know, whether you carry out your business operations with integrity. There are so many aspects that impact how we think about security and safety and how we make decisions about risk. So when you want to know how you make decisions about risk, think about the matrix that I showed you. We tend to make decisions based on whether we are winning or losing and our risk attitude changes according to that. So what's the best way to get out of all of this? The best way is to be prepared. We need to prepare really well. We need to understand what we are preparing for. And that's why capacity planning. Um, one of the um, biggest deficiencies that I know I've noticed over the past, you know, over two decades that I've been in the industry is that most of the companies, most of the organizations, many of us don't really have a tab on what our assets are, what our critical assets are, be it information, be it devices. So asset management is really poor even today. And what do we mean by asset management? If you really don't know what your empire looks like or what your organization looks like, what are the key assets that you need to protect? What is important to you? If we don't have that classification, categorization and prioritization, it is very hard to protect because you cannot literally protect, put a bu bubble around everything. So that's why asset recognition is very important. We need to characterize it based on priority. That way it becomes easier for us to segregate our assets, give them priority in terms of security and confidentiality and whether or not they have to be available 24 seven and depending on these decisions, we can then provide the relevant safety and security for these assets. Now that you have a very high level, a very quick overview of what critical infrastructure is, what do we mean by ICS and how does cybersecurity relate to all of these things, you might be wondering, so what can I do to help protect our ICS? Of course, as I say here, you must join in the workforce for the future. Skills required to defend our ICS. Now, here are some of the skills that I recommend learning. Um, the first, I would start with understanding network protocols and how they might differ in industrial systems. So take time to actually study network protocols. Take time to study operating systems, how the kernel and the core of the operating systems work, because most of the security vulnerabilities exist within this core. So it's very important for us to understand how legacy systems work, how new systems work, and what are the um, middle layer applications that connect these two. We really need to understand that. So you could start with that. On top of that, you could understand what policy and safety regulations mean in industrial zones. They look very different compared to the safety, uh, the security policies that you might see in an IT sector. So it's very important for us to understand what these safety regulations are. And you also have to remember that every country has a different set, almost similar, but they, there could be some differences in the way a country recognizes their critical infrastructure. For In some countries, for example, there are about, uh, in, in the US, we have about 16 sectors that we classify under critical infrastructure. In UK, I think we have 13. So you have to understand the definition of critical infrastructure while it remains the same. What is designated as a critical infrastructure may vary between countries. So it would be a nice step forward to understand, apart from the policies and regulations in industrial zones, what are critical sectors in each of these countries that you're working with? So it would be nice to understand, learn that. And um, some of the basic things, it's good to understand how electrical, electronic and mechanical devices work together in industrial systems. So it might be really nice, perhaps if you're considering taking a degree now, you're at that stage, then maybe you should consider an engineering degree. You could study engineering. So, you know, the question, how does engineering relate to cybersecurity? Will I become a hacker? 
Yes, that's not the question to think about. Now, that is a very single focused question. You have to think about interconnected risks. You have to think about all these things that I have shared in the past few minutes to say, why should I be looking at these things and how does it relate with cybersecurity? The next one, understanding risks, vulnerabilities, threats and impact on communities due to an industrial system failure. Now, I've told you about the different um, aspects of why industrial security and critical systems are important to us as civilians which means we have to understand the interconnected risks that these systems bring if they are on the internet and available via remote administration. If something fails in the systems, how does it impact our daily life? So one example is a water treatment plan. What happens if a water treatment plan, the actuator goes shuts off? Maybe the sewage system doesn't work. Our water systems get polluted. Just imagine what might come out of your tap. Is it safe enough to drink? So you have to think about interconnections at that level. Start from the industry, think about your own life and think about how these two things are connected now. We cannot only think about information in the modern context. We have to think about physical safety and security. Therefore, we have to understand what are the defenses? What do we mean by business continuity? And what do we actually mean by resilience? for each of these systems, which means when something happens, do we have a backup plan? If the internet were to go down in a certain part of the region, do we have backup of working without the internet? It almost seems um, pervasive how we tend to Google everything. Can you do that? Can you think of options and solutions without Googling? Do you have access to telephone directories and information at your fingertips written down somewhere? Do you have a physical backup of things? These are the type of things that you have to think about in order to become resilient in the modern context. And that's why this matters. Beyond all these things, you also have to understand the cultures and geopolitics of the world. What's going on in the world is very important because what happens elsewhere will now impact our lives directly be it a health pandemic or be it a cybersecurity issue. We really have to pay attention to what is going on in the world, which means we have to understand the politics that's going on in the world and how those politics can play into the services that we have and perhaps how the services could be used as a tool to conduct cyber warfare. Now, this is not an endorsement of AWS, but I just thought um, because I really like um, the ser these services and um, they're one of my favorites, I thought I should share this with you. So pick up your favorite cloud service any from any vendor and look at what type of cloud services they offer, what type of uh, specifically with respect to IoT and um, ICS. Look at what um, uh, software they offer. Look at what kind of equipment and devices they offer. And maybe go ahead and learn the skills because these are the type of skills we'll need for the future. And um, you could learn about threat modeling. That's a nice uh, start as well to understand what exactly happens in the mind of an attacker. And how do you go about resolving that or counter attacking that or defending that? So this slide gives you some sort of um, a start to that with a few links here, uh, some of my favorite links. But also, if you look at this uh, little graphic on the right hand side, you see that the adversary group uses techniques. And this is by MITRE. The techniques accomplish certain tactics. And the adversary group also uses software and social engineering to achieve what they want to achieve in terms of a cyber attack. So this is a really nice graphic and I highly recommend um, going through the MITRE attack and the cyber kill chain um, to understand how exactly an attacker thinks so that you can defend in the same way by following the tracks. Now I mentioned about geopolitics. So this is another area where I would highly recommend um, you uh, looking into is international relations and international security. Take these courses, take, get a degree maybe, 
and study how nations perceive cybersecurity. It's a very different lens you'll get by studying international relations and world politics and security at a global level to understand how countries think about cybersecurity. What kind of systems do they have in place? So you're taking a very high level view at security. And it helps you understand the interconnections when you zoom out and look at things from a higher level. And then you also understand what type of international laws apply to the field of cybersecurity. So here I recommend a good place to start would be the NATO website. They have um, wonderful resources for you to go look at and, and study if you like. Uh, the Talent 2.0 manual is also a great start. It's one of my favorite places to understand um, cyber laws. It is available online, so you could look at the online resource and look at all the different laws that they have created. It is not a, um, a binding law, but it is sort of put together as a guidance for the cybersecurity community. Uh, and here's a learning map that I offer, so you could say, you know, understand the key terms. And this is basically the learning map that I have designed the slide deck as well. So make sure you use this as sort of help to uh, my help you go from point to point in navigating the cybersecurity field. And now the next thing is to understand gaps, why and how all these matter and what are the issues we face today. So we've already talked about this. Digital technologies increasingly feature in what we call the asymmetric warfare. What is asymmetric warfare? They are attacks by smaller countries and less powerful countries and non-state actors on larger, powerful states. So you can look at more at this in, in the Global Risks Report from the World Economic Forum. Very important point to remember is war zones are now no longer limited to a distinct geographic area. Because of how industrial systems are now connected on cyber realm, cyber warfare can actually impact our physical lives. And that's why I say war zones are no longer limited to a geographic area. Now here's the state. And this is why it's important for us to pay attention to the cybersecurity workforce. This is a report from 2019 from ISC Squared. And the report clearly shows us that there aren't enough people to monitor, prevent, and deter cyberspace. And this is a picture that you can see by region, by different regions of the workforce gap in each of these regions. And here's a very interesting statistic that I thought I must share um, as a uh, piece of data that is relevant. Now, this there is a um, global cybersecurity index, and they rank countries based on several factors. You can see what those factors are in the methodology of the report. I've put in the link at the bottom of this slide. But according to the 2018 report, um, India regionally in the um, Asia-Pacific region stands ranks 10, number 10, and globally it ranks 47 on Global Cybersecurity Index ranking, which means this tells us there is a lot of work to do for us to prepare to become much more proactive and resilient as a country to secure the resources and our people. And here's another graphic that has a piece of data I like giving you these uh, pieces of data because it makes more sense when you look at facts. Um, what this slide tells you is that the potential that females give us in terms of labor force is much higher compared to the potential labor force of men. And this is um, quite consistent across the different um, income groups, as you can see here. And I've marked it um, with the uh, red blocks here. So this effectively means that we must match potential to workforce gaps. So you saw the previous slide where I said that we don't have enough cybersecurity professionals in our workforce to protect and defend our countries. And here in this slide, you're seeing that there are women available who are ready to contribute to the workforce, but we are not utilizing their services and skills in the right way. There is a gap between the supply and the demand. So we must close this gap. So why aren't we able to close these gaps? Because there are barriers. 
what are those barriers? Now, I haven't tried to be very exhaustive in listing out the barriers, but here are some of my favorites. Women in STEM. Now, although we think uh, by, if you, if you try to Google data on um, women in science and technology fields, we might be under an impression that, uh, let's say a country like India has many women in engineering streams. But that does not actually translate to quality outcomes in terms of workforce. So there is still a gap. But the fact being that globally, we still have far less women in science and technology fields. And without onboarding women into STEM fields, we will not be able to close the highly skilled workforce gaps that cybersecurity requires. And without women already in these STEM fields, we will not be able to mentor women for future positions, which means it becomes our duty, all the women that are in the field today, for example, someone like me, it becomes my duty to be available to mentor other women for future positions. And this is another graphic that's really interesting. It's from um, a cyber crime magazine, as you can see here, is that they anticipate. Um, so this is the current state of women, and they anticipate that we'll have roughly about 3.5 million women in uh, by 2021, although no one might have anticipated uh, the COVID-19 global pandemic, which means all of the numbers that have been projected before 2020 are literally um, in a manner of skew now because of the pandemic. So the numbers vary. Now here's another graphic that tells you the male versus female cybersecurity workforce composition by region. So if you look at Asia Pacific, there's only 10% of the population are female in cybersecurity workforce. Whereas if you look at North America, although it's not very great, but it's 14%. So you have to look at all of this data to understand why having women in cybersecurity is such an important topic for us and why we have to really work towards it. This is another graphic that that shows the ratio of um, men versus women in the types of roles that um, they do. And then as you can see, um, engineering, data, AI, engineering, and cloud computing, it progressively gets lesser and lesser. So you've got barely 12% of females working in cloud computing. So these are some of the more granular data that you can look at to understand where gaps exist and what are those areas that you can potentially get into as you think about workforce, joining the workforce, and about learning skills that are relevant to help you get into that workforce. Here's another graph that tells um, where are male and female distributed across different roles. So you can see um, the blue slice of pie that you see is a share of women across all of those roles that you see here. And the rest is all dominated by men, which means we really have a lot of work to do as women. But it's not just about women not getting into STEM enough or it's not about women not being in the workforce enough. There are issues why women aren't able to get into STEM. And there are issues why women aren't in the workforce as we might want them to. And one of those issues are, um, comes around to gender discrimination. And this is a, um, a piece of data that you can see here that shows unconscious discrimination as a major, the major reason that women um, do not continue to um, thrive in the industry. And that's a pretty high number, 87% of unconscious discrimination. What does it mean? That means we don't even realize that we are discriminating women. 87% of women say, think that, that there's a lot of unconscious discrimination. This is one of the most easiest and one that we can tackle by understanding that human, as human beings, we have bias and fallacies. And by recognizing those bias and fallacies, we can actually overcome some of this unconscious discrimination. And then across the other factors, we can definitely work through 
gender policies within our organizations, within even within um, IT and cybersecurity organizations, to make sure that there are good gender policies to support women, to support your colleagues, women colleagues, and mentor them, and make sure um, that they feel wanted and invited as part of the team across different roles. So some of the suggestions that I have is um, we really have to mentor women. We have to help them. We have to recognize to begin with what are the barriers that women face. And some of these barriers will be easy to tackle through policies and sometimes by education and awareness. Those are some of the easiest ones that we can resolve. But then there are the harder ones. The harder ones are getting more women into STEM. Even harder ones are in certain part of the culture. Perhaps a woman has difficulty staying in her field of work because either she's of a marriageable age or she needs to get married or she needs to have children. There are different social and cultural norms that bind women to duties that the gender stereotypical duties that we ask of them. So perhaps by becoming aware and creating policies that are much more conducive and women friendly, we'll be able to have more women and retain more women in our industry in cybersecurity. Um, I do have a few links at, towards the end of this slide. I put them in appendix, uh, but please do feel free to go through them because they're quite useful resources, although I will not be going through them um, in our presentation here. So I hope this brief overview of what industrial security is, how cybersecurity is interconnected with our lives, and now why this matters in our present context of industrial industry 4.0 is relevant and especially relevant to women because the workforce lacks women, visibly lacks women. And then there are barriers that prevent women from coming into the workforce, staying in the workforce. If we address these barriers, we will have more people available to defend the growing number of attacks that we face as we bring more and more devices onto the internet. So I hope this is helpful and thank you very much for joining us.